All right. Uh, welcome, Troy. Um, Thank you, John. I think I think we're ready for this. Uh, I, I've been preparing, as I told you up front. Um, I'm nervous about this one. Uh, it, it, this means a lot to me. I want to do it right. I had so much appreciation for your father and your family and such great memories. I just want to, you know, do it properly. Um, before we get rolling, I want to mention, uh, you know, we do this. I do these things for the industry for free. Uh, so to pay me back, give us a like if you can. <laughs> uh, and uh, that that's always very helpful. All right, before I introduce Robert Heindel, I'm gonna introduce um, his second son, Troy. Uh, Troy is the curator of the Heindel Legacy and Collection. Um, Troy, as I said, is the second son of, of, of Robert and Rose Heindel. Troy worked as a technologist for over 35 years, including six years at NASA Johnson Space Center as a space shuttle flight controller. Got it right that time, I think. Um, Troy, unlike his father and brother, uh, Todd, does not paint. Uh, Troy watched his dad's art evolve over many years and was fortunate to be able to attend many of his father's art shows around the world. And so with that, I'm going to start having some slides go by. Um, and there, there he is right there. The dapper, tall, handsome gentleman in the center. And who's he having a conversation with? Can you tell me about this picture? This just thing just amazes me. Uh, tell, tell me who's in this picture. Well, you you see, I, um, I'm introducing my then girlfriend, Susan Budge, to Princess Diana. And, and then you see off to the left is my father with his arms crossed and holding one up to his chin kind of smiling and smirking that, uh, that, that grin of his. That is the cat who ate the canary back exactly. in the back. <laughs> right there. Exactly. I assume this is at an opening. This and... is in London. This is at an opening in London. Mm -hmm. And, and that was, you know, kind of one of his gigs was he would uh, open shows and try to make them big events and, uh, the, the royalty, you know, in this case, Princess Diana, who was a patron of the arts, uh, would attend. And, you know, she, she you know, uh, uh, owned a number of his pieces and, um, and he would, you know, she'd ask him, would you paint this ballet? And he'd work on something, you, you know, as a favor. And, um, you know, so it was a, a collaborative relationship mm -hmm. and you know she's very generous to to open these shows and you know talk to the crowds and you know I mean it, it was her job that it is their job to do that but but I you know my father was always taken with her she was very very lovely person well I can imagine that was a huge benefit to your father uh, in in many ways uh, oh, yeah. Your dad, and we'll we'll talk more about it as we go through it. But your your father was an incredibly charming man. Um, I loved being around him. He filled the room. Um, he was witty. He was funny. Um, he was very direct in observations. Uh, he said say, things to me as a child that I'll never forget. I mean, it was just like <laughs> it just whoa. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and, and some of it I won't that. go there. <laughs> yeah, he didn't hold back. He was no filter in it. But you know, he talked about uh, to me over time uh, when I when I was starting out as an illustrator. He was very uh, courteous and generous. Um, I was fortunate to study with Bob uh, at the um, illustrators' workshops along with the other great illustrators there: Bob Peak, um, uh, my father, um, Alan Kober. Uh, who else did, who else have, have Fred, Fred Otnes and Bernie Fuchs yeah. and uh, phenomenal experience. And it was interesting. It was a little different for me. And I think your father recognized it. I was in an odd spot. I was in a difficult spot and I include your father. One of the reasons I'm doing this talk is this was a big influence on me. Um, my work is not that reflective of it right now, but it, for a time it was. And um, he was, it was more than an influence, uh, just artistically, just personally. 
And uh, I just thought your father was a, a, an amazing individual. I, and, I mean, I, and I adored your mother too. She was just fa fabulous. I, I was, actually, we had, you know, our families were very close and it was uh, yeah. a lot of great memories from there. Absolutely. So yes. I'm going to uh, talk about kind of where, how all this started and where the connection was made, that type of thing. Um, and, and I'll start showing images here in just a minute or two. But um, uh, first of all, as I talk about influences, there were three influences your father had conversations with me about along the way. His influence of Francis Bacon, the obvious influence of uh, Edgar Degas, and then later Gerhard Richter. Um, and there were others that, I mean, he talked to me about, I, I, I didn't, I, I didn't, as much uh, see it, but I know it was there, uh, his influence from Gauguin. Um, sure. um, but he, as an illustrator, and I think uh, as a lot of very su as successful il illustrators that made transition to, uh, and not a, very few of them made the transition as, as successful as he did to, to the fine art world, but he, he was very aware of what was going on in, in the painting world and so he his influence he was it wasn't pulling influences from illustrators at a certain point he was pulling influences from the fine artists that he was applying first to illustration and then to his uh his own career as a painter um your father was uh was born in 1938 and i believe he grew up in toledo um, he is uh one of three adopted uh children um and um maybe maybe you could you talked you talked about his his mother the other day it was really it was a really funny conversation of uh you she was she worked as like a factory worker uh, yeah yeah Char charlotte his mother charlotte heindel uh actually assembled carburetors at willie's jeep in uh in toledo and uh yeah, she's she's four foot one inches tall, and you know her son's all over six feet tall, and and she was she was she was tough on them, and you know I, I think the story I was telling you was uh, when they'd misbehave, and generally it was all at the same time, she'd uh, line them up in the kitchen, and she'd have to stand on a stool and smack them with the broom upside the head. <laughs> His punishment, and they of course found this very amusing, and it was hard for them not to laugh that this tiny, you know, mother was yeah was trying to punish them. But uh, yeah, but she was she was his first great supporters. I, I think you know artists you know need a support mechanism, uh, and. Um, and and certainly she was she was a huge supporter encouraged him from a very early age to to uh to paint to draw and to excel at at his craft and 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 i think so that was a very solid beginning for him but i don't really have i don't have artwork from his childhood um <laughs> but i but I, I do I do love this picture that's up there right now. This is of of you and your older brother Toby, who I consider I was right in between age wise. Toby was year older than me, and you were a year younger. And we spent had tremendous fun together as children. Um, and I, I I you said this the other day is that yeah my father always painted me as the girl. <laughs> yeah, so so of course I <laughs> I would complain strongly. Why am I a girl again? <laughs> And I, and I answered that question the other day. It's because you were so damn pretty. <laughs> <laughs> um, your father, um, you jump forward a little bit. When he was when he was young, he was 16 years old. Uh, he uh, got the, the and became part of the famous artist course, the correspondent, really uh, well put together, great information, uh, correspondence course uh, uh, called the famous artist school. And um, many great, it was put together by Al Dorn. Uh, Rock Welder was a contributor. Um, Fuchs and my father were contributors. Um, and I think your father was considered the last of the faculty uh, that they hired as the famous artist group. 
mm-hmm. but by not by a little bit, <laughs> but but was by far their most successful student. <laughs> 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 and so they treated your father very, very well. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's a, that is an amazing story. Um, uh, so he spent his, uh, his, you know, growing up in Toledo. Um, I think the uh, prominent note, he met, he, he met his wife in Toledo, um, uh, uh, Rosalie, Petrus, did you say, or Petrus? Petrus. Uh, Petrus. Petrus. I, I I knew her my whole life as Rose, and um, as everything, as you know, your father looked like an actor. She looked like an act- actress. She was one of the most beautiful women. <laughs> yeah, she 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 certainly was. She was she gorgeous. Was a looker. She was absolutely gorgeous. Just just loved her. And sweet as could be, always was just gracious. And um, I, I mean, I mean, even the the, the I, I saw the last time I saw her, I think I went and visited her at her home in Guilford, Connecticut. You had moved from Easton to Guilford, and uh, went with my father. Your father had had already passed away. I think it was in two thousand six or two thousand seven, and yeah. it was just you know just exactly the same, just friendliest person on the planet. Um, yeah, yeah, she was. Um, so they got married like 1959. Um, your father moved to Detroit and got a job as kind of followed the path of what Bernie did and what my father did. They moved to Detroit and worked in the, the car industry, um, uh, putting brochures and catalogs together for the car industry. Um, he worked for the New Center Studio, which was a very famous art studio in Detroit. Um, had great success there, as the others did, and then had his eye on New York, uh, of moving to New York. And we were just talking right before we started. I remember the day I met the Heindel family. Uh, they moved to, uh, they rented a house in Westport, Connecticut in 1967 or 1968. And I think you were there, you know, short of a year and then their uh, uh, your parents bought a house in Easton, Connecticut, and that's what I remember as the Hyde Nail House. In fact, this last summer, I I went up and kind of went through all my old, old stomping grounds uh, in, in the Connecticut area, and I drove by the Easton House on Banks Road, um, and there's a school across the street, which, yeah, no, no, that's, which that's I, no I, longer a farm. It was a pig farm. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> They yep. grew corn uh, to feed the pigs, and uh, I just remember a lot of uh, fun exploration over there. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, we we used to run around in the pig pens yeah. to get them to chase us, like the mother yeah. pigs would chase us. Yeah, and that was we'd often fun. lose our shoes. Yeah, in the pig poop because you know we'd be <laughs> up to our ankles in it, and the, we'd be run trying to get an escape before the pig would catch us. <laughs> So how little we knew about how dangerous those pigs could be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. Well, um, your father spent uh, the next, I don't know, uh, 15 to 20 years becoming one of the most formidable illustrators in the world. And I have a, a whole group of slides of some of his early illustration work. I tried to put this together chronologically. I I could only do it by stylistically. And so I don't know. And your your dad, much like my father, wandered <laughs> with with their their growth and their direction with their art, uh, which was which is what made them great, I think. Uh that and the amount of effort they put into it. Um it was interesting. Uh, you know, Todd ended up being an artist and I ended up being an artist. I had no interest of doing art. When I knew you as a child, it was not on my radar at all. I was watching it like you were, we, and we were affected by it. Right. Uh, the things that we saw, I think, you know, I, I told you the other day, the thing when I noticed that my father was doing something that was important is when the Tommy the Who rock opera album came out and right. everybody in high school, you know, was talking about, oh my God, that that was, you know, Mark's dad. He did that piece. Um, and yeah. It, 
Yeah, yeah, we we didn't didn't really register with us, did it? I mean, no. I would I would have friends over, and you know, we'd be playing around the house, and and I'd take them into the studio, and in the, I don't know if you remember at the time, but in the studio, my my father had done a, a, a series of paintings for you know, like one of those soft porn magazines. I don't know whether it was Cosmo or something like that. And so he had a series of paintings of him and my mother naked and making love um, <laughs> all the way around. And and he, I bring these, you know, young boys in, you know, I don't know, 12 years old, and they'd be like, whoa, <laughs> and paintings. And I'd be like, what's the matter? You never seen a naked person before? <laughs> and, they, and they'd be like, who are these people? I'm like, oh, that's my parents. <laughs> and, and, you know, it just went right over my head. I just, you know, we we were exposed to it day in, day out. We didn't think about yeah. it. It was it was uh, a, an incredibly romantic childhood, though. Yes. Um, and I think it was because our parents were so, um, first of all, I don't think we realized how successful they were. They were our parents, but they were very, very successful in their field. And it took them a lot of places. I just had, I've just previously done a talk about Bernie Fuchs and, you know, it showed photos of him in the Oval Office taking pictures of Robert F. Kennedy and, and Lyndon B. Johnson. And it's like their illustrations, the, the their success took them all over the world, took them, they met really interesting people, um, very famous people. They illustrated these stories and these and, and uh, uh, images about these people. I was not, I saw all that and I thought it was fascinating once I started to learn about it. But the thing I didn't like was how hard they worked. Um, yeah. They worked really hard. Yes. Um, and be, because, because of the, you know, they got they worked really hard to get great at what they were doing, but their but their facility and their ability to do what they did brought them all this success and all of this additional work <laughs> where they were they were under the gun all the time. Um, again, yeah, I, I think yeah, I, th I think being an illustrator, uh, my understanding of teaches you discipline. You have to be disciplined about your time and and how much time you can you can spend on. On, on these pieces right um, yeah these these pictures are from uh ayn rand books and uh, uh the models are you know my mother and father but he 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 would tell me stories about meeting ayn rand in new york he, you know he'd go into their office and uh you know it'd be a room like a boardroom set up with a bunch of men in the chairs, all looked alike, all the same suit. If you if you've read Ayn Rand, you'd you'd appreciate the the, the, you know, the, the archetype that she was looking for in her vice presidents. And then she'd be at the end of the table, you know, at the head of the table, commanding the room. And here, my father would prance in with his cigarette, you know, very <laughs> relaxed and. You know, he'd go light her cigarette and, you know, sit down next to her and have a casual chat while all these men, you know, stood straight in their seats with their ties straight, you know, not saying anything. And, you know, he he loved that kind of interaction that he had when he was doing these uh, book covers. Well, you know, it's interesting because that part of what he did as a painter later on, that ability to communicate in that person his personality because he was the first one to suggest to me he said like if you know if you're if you are going in this direction in the painting world he said they buy the artist as much as they do the art <laughs> and he said part of it is showbiz and, and and I just love how he said it to me and uh uh your, your father was uh again just an amazingly charming guy um and you always, you always feel, you always felt like you were talking to an actor or, or uh, of, of a Hollywood star. Um, and, and I, it came to him very natural. I don't think any of it was phony. I think it was just, it was, a, it was just him. And, but he yeah. really did talk about the showbiz aspect of, and, and he really pursued that in this painting career. Um, he used it to his advantage for sure. 
Yeah, and an emphasis on on the business part. He he certainly understood that it was a business that you needed to to build on your successes, and um, otherwise, you know, if you didn't get paid, you weren't you weren't going to get to make that next piece. And that uh, certainly uh, his appreciation for the business aspect of it helped him, uh, perhaps even more so in the fine art career. Yeah. Um... And we're, I'm going to talk about that later on because he did it in a really unique way. He was a, a kind of a control freak about it. I, I shouldn't yeah. say, that, but he yeah, no, really, no. he controlled everything and he didn't, it wasn't necessarily, you know, generally, traditionally uh, galleries will, will support a, an artist over a long period of time and build their reputation through the galleries. Your father really took that upon himself at the beginning and the galleries became afterwards. I mean, he arranged the shows, he arranged the, um, the venues, all of that stuff, put, put, he created these venues for himself and these shows. And it was pretty spectacular how he did it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, um, I think it was relatively unique what, what he did where the relationship he had with, the galleries in Europe and Japan, especially, they 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 were really quite dedicated to his work. Um, they had they would have other artists because he he can't you know he could do one maybe two shows a year you know produce enough work for one or two shows a year so he couldn't fill them all up but um, he was there you know for that fine art period, he was their main stay and, um, and, and they would, you know, work with him. You know, for example, he, he hated to, I don't know what, how you feel about this, but he hated giving titles to paintings, <laughs> right? Yeah. That was he, uh, my, my father's biggest shortcoming too. And, and, you know, my father, when he started doing these landscapes, he would put, put landscape number three. <laughs> and then of course you know his organization of it had to get you know it, as it got more serious you know okay you have three paintings titled landscape landscape number three <laughs> we, we have to you know let number three a three b you know i mean we had you know had to go in and correct all that stuff later on <laughs> yeah no, I, I feel yeah yeah my my father did a uh, hundred and three painted walls and they're right. named painted wall number one, two, three, <laughs> etc. <cetera. laughs> the galleries didn't like that. They would they would name pieces. Uh, right. And he'd be like, sure, name it. But you know, to to my father, it was he wanted the viewer to really name it for themselves. I I, I I'm thinking of something that I read and I remember your father saying this to me. And, and this, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. We're still going through really early illustration work. Yeah. And, not, and, and, and I say early illustration work. This was great work, but it became, I'm going to get you to some of the iconic illustration work that he did that like was happening when I was going to school. And I was just absolutely blown away. And he, it was, it, it turned kind of the illustration world upside down for a while. It changed the direction of what people were doing. And it, 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 it was, it's spectacular. But I remember him talking about, you mentioned the viewer and the people that are looking at his work. And I've read this and him saying this to me that your father worked in a mixed media, uh, with mixed media and probably archivally it needed to be under glass. And, and there was a quote and I, I don't know which book it was in or if I saw it on the website or whatever, but there was this quote. He said, I wanted, um, I wanted the viewer to have the experience of seeing my work behind glass because they could see themselves in the reflection as they're looking at the work. He loved that intimate view. Mm. That brought, and I thought, oh my God, that's that's genius. <laughs> <laughs> it's also a great way to explain, yeah, it needs to be under glass because it's not because it's archivally better that way. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, these are wonderful. I haven't seen uh, a lot of these in years, and some of them I've never seen. So uh, some of these older illustrations. I, this one, of course, yeah, I 
I have people send me stuff of my father's that I've never seen before. And, and it's just like, how did I not see that? You know, I, I figure I know more about it than anybody because I, I, I watched him do a lot of it, especially when I got into my later teens, I got really close to what he was doing. Um, I look at this as a, an iconic piece of your father's. This is a Time Magazine cover. Um, and um, I it was probably probably one of the most seen things your father had done up to this time. Um, yeah, and his illustration started to change. You're going to see some some differences in his work here, um, where it becomes more painterly, um, a little bit more. Um, you, you know, you're fine. Uh, it's more complex. Some of it's more complex. The materials become more complex. Um, you sent these to me the other day, and I had not seen a few of these, but this is. Um, this is obviously what the magazine world was kind of slowing down the editorial world and the institutional world became very, became a great working place for the illustrators during the late seventies and early eighties. Um, you know, uh, Fred Otnes dominated that uh, 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 arena for a, a long period of time. He made a fortune doing it because Every year he was doing like Honeywell and IBM. He's doing their annual reports and was being being paid a fortune to do those things. Um, yeah. Um, but it, it you know this is outside of the editorial world. This is actually I think I, was this Sports Illustrated? Do you know? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Was it part, was it part of that assignment that I mentioned with the piece that I'm sharing? I think I, it, I think it, it it very well could be. Yeah. It was yeah. Uh, covering. Um, uh, college basketball of the big eight at the time and i have a really great story to tell about that and it's one of one of my favorite experiences with your father that's got to be tv guide yeah and um and interesting you can see the difference uh he's now working on the back of linen um and you know he's using pastel he's using oil pastel he's using uh paint sticks and oil paint um and combining them all together there and it, it just had a, a really different look and feel to it and it definitely became his own his own look um obviously you know i mentioned some of his uh, uh influences and you can you know I, I really thought of francis bacon when i you know when i saw this piece uh, well, actually, I saw this piece before I learned who Francis Bacon was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, this was a movie piece. Yeah. Evan Klein, Meryl Streep. So, is it that's Sophie's Choice? I'm, I assume it is. If it's, uh, that's, it would have to be. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's... Uh... Brooks Shields, um, you know, the couple gets the island. Yeah. Whatever, whatever they're stranded on the island. I don't know what. Yeah. Yeah. Those were some really nice pieces. I, I, I like those. There's a couple from there that he did. This one kills me. I mean, just, a, just as a, 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 you know, pretty straightforward for your father, but he did straightforward really well. <laughs> <laughs> he had, he had, he had such great, you know, drawing and painting chops, he could go so many places. And, you know, just a painting of a house. I don't know if the, I don't know what this was for, Troy. So, um, and I, I don't remember. It, it pro looks like it's uh, possibly for a, a golf resort or something, <laughs> but it's just, it's gorgeous. Southern, Southern house, right? Yeah. Palm trees. Yeah. Kind of a Napa Valley home. Uh, beautiful trees. Uh, these probably were done much later. But I just thought I included them with the illustration uh, just because, I mean, they they don't relate to his paintings as much. Maybe some of his drawings. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, a little. this is for Dreyfus um, before it was bought, you know, and, and lion, the lion was their mascot. And, and my parents used to go to Africa, you know, every few years, Kenya and Tanzania. He loved animals. Uh, he absolutely loved animals and so he was he was so happy to be able to draw you know african animals and 
you know, he, he didn't need to do as many. He did like 50 drawings of lions and zebras and, uh, and other African wildlife animals, you know, even though he only needed a few for that, for that annual report, but we ended up with quite a few and, you know, you could tell he just, he loved drawing these, these well, creatures. He, he did it so well. And it looked like he was really bought into these is why I, I, I displayed them. I just love, yeah. love how he did these. Uh, again, this is kind of the new approach to the way he was working uh, on the linen with, um, uh, pastel and paint and man, is it gorgeous uh, um, I like that one you your I've always loved this you're, obviously your mother was the model yeah it's always you know handy to have a wife that looks like Sophia Loren <laughs> <laughs> if you need a beautiful model right yeah. <laughs> and this when I first saw he did a series of these when I first saw this I think I it was I don't know if it was Pendleton I kind of think it was um but it was it was for the uh, apparel company oh. and and he was marketing that shirt um not a bad advertisement for a shirt <laughs> <laughs> i like that shirt <laughs> i don't know why this, yeah. something strange is yeah. happening <laughs> but man his design work it was it was so interesting i don't i'm not sure what this was done for if this was an olympic piece yeah, um it's the Olympics. Um, he did. Yeah, I remember a bunch of series of swimmers and things that he did for the Olympics that were phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I thought I thought all the guys worked on this. Your dad included, you know, yeah, dad, I, I, I think my dad did basketball and wrestling. <clears throat> okay, You're yeah. right. You're right. This is a portfolio that was all put together from the Olympic Committee. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I I love these pieces. I too. Um, I thought they're terrific. I, I obviously had a lot of fun with it. Okay. This when I saw this, this changed my life. It, it <laughs> really did. I was like, okay, this is a different world. This is a different level. And as as <laughs> uh, uh, the material. The point of view, I mean, this is a great rhino, but it's been redesigned by your father. And your father's broken every rule about tangents that you could possibly, you know, go over. And uh, and he made them all work. And uh, again, very similar. My, my dad was, you know, uh, he said he built his career on breaking tangent rules. Um your father leaned into it so heavily and he continued to do so for a long period of time. But I remember when I first saw this piece and I was like, Oh, Dan, that's like a completely different level. Um, amazing piece. Absolutely. He, he, I, I heard him say several times that he spent the, the first half of his career learning how to paint and he's spending the second half of his career learning how not to paint, how to, how to learn to paint like a, five-year-old yeah absolutely you know not following any of the rules so i mean um that's something we can talk about later but i uh you know i think your father would live to be 67 or 68 years old yeah. um and he accomplished so much um he he you know did so much work it amazes me how much work he compressed in that time um my father had the benefit i mean he worked up until a few days before he passed away at 85 um yeah. And so he developed, I mean, I mean, I mean, just just produced so much work. And I'm just blown away when I go back and look at that compressed period of that quarter of century of your father doing the, you know, paintings, the the dancers, how far, how much work he created is absolutely uh, very prolific. And, and a lot of this stuff is at pretty good scale. I mean, it's big. Yes. Yep. Yeah, that was um. Yeah, I mean, he did one piece that was 25, 26 feet long. Oh, my gosh. Where did he do it? In, uh, in the house in Easton. And he, you know, they, they had done a number of additions. And he had oh, to yeah. do this down one wall, around a corner, down another wall. <laughs> I, got a, I got a picture of it coming up. Not the painting, but the studio. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, the... These are at the Easton House, and uh, 
the prior one was my older brother and my father modeling for that. And that, yeah, that, uh, that's my older brother. I have that painting. That's and a that, great piece. Yeah, I, I like it. I like, there's something about it kind of spooky. And then, uh, you know, he and my mother, I, I looked, there was an illustration I looked for that was, that he did of, it looked like Morocco. It reminds me of um, like a Soroya painting uh, that it had the same trees and, but he designed these trees in this painting. I could not find it. I looked all over for it, but he designed these trees in this painting. And I, it, it was something I, and I probably could go back and find it in this, the Society of Illustrators annuals. Um because I think that's where I saw it. And it just devastated me. I think he showed it in an ad that he ran at, at, uh, for Bill Airlocker, his agent. Uh -huh. uh, again, the Gauguin. Rose. Was... Yep. Rose on the beach. So that's my mother on the beach. And uh, when uh, he was taking pictures for that, um, you know, he, he was like, Rose, I want you to walk topless down the beach. And uh, she was like, well, I'm only doing it when there's no one on the beach. And so, <laughs> I had, you know, they were out on the beach. I think this was in um, St. Martin. Uh, and, uh, they're out there, you know, 530 in the morning taking pictures just because you a Vermont <laughs> beach you didn't want to be photographed while there was lots of people. Walking. Trust me, if word got out, there would have been a lot of people on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I, I love that painting. I, I, I do I, too. Yeah, that's, that's, that's killer. Another one of your mom. Gorgeous. And things are things are really changing. Again, back to the uh, Francis Bacon point of view. Um, and, you know, his illustration work this was the work you know very different than where he started out what we saw with the book covers and everything and uh, was becoming much more painterly much more personal and different than what anybody else was doing uh, this was his voice yes and there's a uh, there's him there you have, yeah i believe and that uh, that was a very early piece and i don't even i think that was probably a job, an illustration job. Yeah, you might be better than me, but this is pre fine art career. But N Nureyev and Fontaine loomed large, and you know he had seen them dance uh, in the seventies, and no, no, actually in the sixties. And uh, it, it is a wonderful story of how uh, your father got seduced by the dance by by the dance and he accepted some tickets from his boss uh to go to a, a ballet and he didn't want to but your mom made him go and um he fell in love with it and thought and it really and it emotionally affected him and uh, and he had it in, and that was really early on and he had it in the back of his head for a long time before he got to really explode with it Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's right. Yeah. He and my mother went and uh, yeah, he was just so taken with it that, uh, you know, when, when he decided the time was right to move into the fine art, he knew what he wanted to paint. You know, he wanted to paint dancers. Uh, well, I'm glad he painted this. Uh, <laughs> this was part of that Sports Illustrated series, and Richard Gangle, the art director, sent him to all the schools in the Big Eight. And so the timeline on this is perfect. It's just absolutely perfect. It's 19, like early 1980s. I'm going to school at the University of Kansas. Um, my father told me I had to go to a liberal arts school. If I wanted to be an artist, I had to get my gen eds. And he said, you have to learn about a, a little bit about history and literature, and you got to have a voice, uh, develop a body, a, a voice that you can you can have a well to pull information from. Yes. Uh, and, yeah. and, and, I, and so I, I went there with that intent. And, and at the same time, the school had just hired um, my father's suggestion. They had hired, they got a grant from Hallmark to hire a, a Hallmark chair, and they hired John Collier. And uh, so I, I got the uh, a chance to study, you know, all my art classes came from John Collier when I was at, uh, at K, <laughs> when I was at KU, um, which were terrific. Uh, John was a fa fabulous illustrator, fabulous artist. 
but during my, I don't know, I think it was my, I actually, I think it was my freshman year and I had just gone to, to my first illustrator's workshop and I got, a, I, this was uh, probably it was in the fall, uh, uh, late fall. I got a call at my fraternity house I'm sleeping in from your father. <laughs> 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 which I think is hysterical. <laughs> yeah. I think it was hysterical that I lived in a fraternity house, <laughs> my, my, which my father hated. He absolutely hated that I lived there. Um, <laughs> and, and so that was part of, you know, part of me leaving the University of Kansas was like, thank God you don't live in that fraternity anymore. <laughs> he was not a conformist by any means. <laughs> so so um, um, I get this call from your father saying uh, he's going to be in Lawrence, Kansas on this particular day because he's been hired by Sports Illustrated to cover the basketball, get basketball, you know, actually this year, last year, national championships, uh, Kansas Jayhawks. And so <laughs> he asked me to take him, take him to like where I hung out and we're, uh, learn about the campus and stuff. So I gave him the tour of the campus and stuff. And this is where I spent most of my college <laughs> time. <laughs> I uh, was drinking beer at the, this is called the Wagon Wheel. There's a very famous bar uh, uh, on the on the uh, uh, KU campus. And so I think nothing of it. We go, I, and, and it was like a surreal experience. I'm there with one of my heroes. I mean, somebody who I, I, I idolized as a, as a kid. And he calls me, I'm kind of an adult, not really. <laughs> but I, I'm out drinking beer with, with like, fraternity brothers <laughs> and your father <laughs> i'm sure he loved it <laughs> yeah no, he enjoyed, well, he had a great he had as much fun as i did we had a great <laughs> or at least he pretended he did oh i'm sure um, he did and, and so i don't have another conversation to the next summer i go to the uh illustrators workshop in carmel uh california and he's showing his slides and this came up and i was i had never seen the piece and I didn't, I, I don't know if it was published or not. I'd never seen the piece. And I was like, oh my gosh, he did that piece. It was fantastic. And I said something, he said some kind words about it, how much fun he had and all of that. And when I got back from California, I got back, he had already gone home. Uh, he went, got back sooner. I spent more time in California. And when I got back to my home in, Cal in, uh, in Kansas City, where I lived, this piece was waiting for me. Oh, that's, uh, that's wonderful. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. I like that story. Unbelievable. I do too. <laughs> I love this piece. And right now my son is, uh, he moved home from when COVID happened. He's a, a junior at the University of Kansas. And this painting hangs in his room in our house. And uh, um, I, he gets it. <laughs> <laughs> he gets it. He gets it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I my my goal today was not to get emotional, and I, I, I it's not going to happen. <laughs> uh, I man, all right. There's the man in his studio in Easton. That's right. And uh, I love looking at these things. I mean, I've been in that studio so many times, and and uh, it I didn't see it as many times, but maybe three or four times when he was in his painting career. Um. I saw it. I saw it during his illustration career a lot, because uh, as I spent a lot of time at your house when I was a kid, and um, and again the studio has been remodeled a little bit at this point from what I re originally remember it from the, the way it was set up for illustration, standing up and painting, and just seeing the work pinned up around. I mean, it's just so romantic. And there's the man yeah. amongst amongst the sea that's, of beauty. Uh, yeah, that's all um, uh, for Monte Carlo um that's all for the monte carlo show um yeah Killer. all those pieces all right so um let me get back to some of my facts here get back to my bullet points that i have uh, okay. so that he became this super successful illustrator 1982 wins the hamilton king award from the society of illustrators which is the best illustration done that year and um later on in life uh, posthumously is is uh, nominated to the society of Illust hall of fame um so he's kind of conquered the world of il illustration 
And um, so 1983, he gets an introduction and an opportunity to observe the Royal Ballet and gets permission to produce paintings um, for the Royal Ballet. I, I don't know how that came about or that happened or how he made that happen, but I know he made that happen. Yeah. <laughs> and and so this, uh, oh, um, I, 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 this is where I put a few of his influences in here. Um, just a couple of visuals, the things that, you know, he talked about with me as, you know, as, a, as, as an artist, uh, of people he looked at, people he was heavily influenced by. And as you look through these paintings that we're going to see, you're going to see influences probably more from Degas at the beginning. And then Bacon kind of worked its way in there. Uh, the point of view uh, of the way he structured his pictures kind of started to relate to Bacon's. And then uh, the 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 I, I I think I didn't really realize the Gerhard Richter connection until the the wall paintings, and then it made a lot of sense to me. Um, and yeah. so this work again, uh, the, Troy. This was your girlfriend, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, it was. Yes, Dawn. I remember Dawn. Dawn, the famous Dawn. We. Uh, in our drawing night last night, we were talking about uh, uh, Maxfield Parish, and 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 I told the story, and I just I, I just thought about it. It's the last time I saw Dawn. Um, uh, she came. She you. I don't know if you remember coming to New York, meeting me, and Marsha and I in New York City, and we stayed. You slept on the couch at the St. Regis Hotel. Uh, I was <laughs> hell bent to stay in that hotel where the old King Cole, the Na the Maxfield Parish was. Of course, I couldn't afford it, and and um, I paid for it dearly. Uh, but I remember you walking, uh, meeting us, uh, a pair, pair of cutoffs on and a t-shirt, and carrying a cooler. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yeah, those were the days. Those were the fun days. <laughs> but uh, you know, father, your father using Don as a model. Yeah, yeah. This was at the very early stages of his fine art career. And this is prior to him really being well known uh, amongst the dance companies around the world. And so he was. He asked me, you know, oh, Dawn, your your girlfriend, she uh, she does some dance. Would she mind me photographing her? And so that you know, there's a there number of Dawn paintings, and um, yeah. So a lot of this early stuff is just friends and family. You know, just like during the illustration days, right? Uh, getting people to uh, model for you. Okay, so um, this was a is is a, a very um, uh, Sir Frederick Ashton is a choreographer. Uh, is he a chore choreographer for the uh, Royal Ballet? I, I believe it. Yeah, back then, yes. And this. Um, um, this uh, yeah for the royal ballet this this painting is a part of the permanent collection of national uh, national portrait gallery in london and uh i've always loved this painting uh so, somehow it ended up I, I don't i don't know your father entered it in the society of illustrators it's in the it's in the society of illustrators and it's the first time i saw it and i just always thought it was just a fabulous portrait um so what what a what, great way to represent a very dignified choreographer you know, just awesome and interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love the straight line, the straight black line down his leg. Okay, so um, after he got permission to do those things in 1985, he had, and it relates to this piece, he had uh, an exhibit with 140 paintings and drawings uh, titled Obsession of Dance. The special guest, uh, Princess Margaret, um, and... Uh, I don't know if this was part of that show or if he did it afterwards, um, but that was his first big show with right. a, a major dance company, correct? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So this this one I look at all the time because your father so so generously gave this print of this piece uh, with a beautifully signed note to my wife and I as a wedding present. Um, so I look at it every day. Um, <laughs> it's a beautiful not, piece. Not a bad thing to look at, right? 
um, shortly thereafter that show, or maybe at that show, your father met Andrew Lloyd Webber. Um, yeah, yeah, he, he was at, he went to the show and liked what he saw and, and asked uh, my father if he would paint cats and, uh, you know, uh, cats was already out there and um uh and he ended up doing phantom as well uh and it was interesting because uh weber is a good business person and so even you know they'd make uh, reproductions and some of the pieces and and andrew was getting a cut you know oh really <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, really useful group is his, his business uh, as Andrew Weber's business. And, you know, my mother would have to, at the end of each month, you know, tabulate up, you know, the royalties. <laughs> Send going, a check to Andrew yeah, yeah, Weber. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it was, you know, wasn't covering his coffee bill probably, but, uh, but it was, um, it was funny that, uh, that, you know, he, Andrew was, was very commercially minded as well. And, you know, wasn't going to have images which he was uh, partly responsible for. Uh, you know, not not benefit him as well. So I just thought that was that was interesting. But they they became good friends, and and they they were out to dinner with with Andrew and his 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 then wife, who went on to star in Phantom, and um, you know they uh, they had a lot of good collaborations together i have some of that work coming up here which will be fun to fun to talk at to, uh, to talk about yeah. um maybe uh that, that's that's kind of a fun thing uh you you kind of brought it up your mother doing the tabulation uh his company he created a company called obsession of dance correct that's and, right and yeah. so your your mom organized this something i have not told you um i went as <laughs> as a parent and the things that you do uh this was my youngest son, probably, well, he's a junior and or just finished his junior year at school at college. So this was four years ago, um, three or four years ago, uh, prom night, we went to this home in Kansas City um, that uh, we're to take photos of our kids. I mean, it's kind of like a thing you do, right? You know, and, and so uh, I walk into this house and I walk into about 30 images of your father's hanging on the wall. And I can't help myself. And I'm, 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 I, I, I completely lose what I'm supposed to forget what I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> pictures of the walls and stuff. And the owner, really beautiful home, the owner comes over to me and said, do you know this artist? And I said, that's Robert Heindel. And she was shocked. I knew, and I said, I said, I, I don't only know who he is. I, I knew, I knew him well. And we started this conversation. She said, well, I, she goes, I've never spoken with the artist, but I speak with this lovely woman on the phone all the time named Rose. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I love that experience. I, had, yeah. I, I ended up staying an hour after everybody left, having this conversation with her about each of the pieces that she got. It was great. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that was the, as you mentioned, that that first show was called An Obsession of Dance. And so they created, and, and again, this is, I think, my father's keen business sense. They created a, a, a partnership called The Obsession of Dance uh, and and did reproductions of his paintings and drawings, you know, limited edition prints, serigraphs, et cetera. And, and, and I think part of the idea there was that not everybody could afford to buy one of these paintings or one of these drawings. And so they wanted to provide an entry point to the artwork at the different price points. I know this is terribly utilitarian, but but it no, was it's, it's it's the way galleries think too. It's like uh, uh, my gallery director is always saying, "Okay, we make most of our money off the big paintings. Do bigger paintings, but uh, you need to do small paintings too because there's people that can't afford the big paintings." <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, so so you, you and and you know they that that worked very well. And my mother ran that business 
And so, you know, he, my father would be painting and my mother would work with the galleries, you know, getting things printed. My father would have to sign them, thousands of them, you know, sometimes at a time and, and, and ship them around the world uh, to be no, sold. This, this is actually an interesting time to bring this up, Troy, um, and, or to further what we started. Um, your father had a really uh, kind of organic way <laughs> of, of running his business. Uh, and it started with the point of him looking at where he was as an illustrator, and what he wanted to do is to transfer as a fine artist, as a painter. And he was, I think he mentioned somewhere I read that he was about 44 years of age when he kind of analyzed all that. And he in 1982, is that's when he wanted to make the, I guess he was 44 in 1982. He wanted to make the, he was going to quit taking on illustration work and just take on, um, you know, just produce paintings. Um, so most painters, most fine artists kind of work their way through a gallery system. Um, mm. And they, they grow inside of a gallery. They use the mailing list, the mailing list, they, the, the gallery, good galleries that, that, that are collector galleries. They have a body of people that buy and they take their suggestions and, and they push an artist. Um, he thought he was too old at 44 to That's do right. that, which, which, I, I don't believe is true. I think my my dad went more of the gallery direction and he did it when he was about 50. And um uh and he and he made it he made it work, but he struggled with the battle of, you know, <laughs> he said the I this is so typical of my father. He said, you know, the worst, the worst thing a gallery will will look at, the thing that you that you could bring to the gallery would be the worst thing would be an illustrator you know they looked at it as like oh we don't want to carry that illustrator he yeah, said right. he said the very worst thing you could be is a really famous illustrator <laughs> 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 that was his perception uh, your 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 father and mine had a similar opinion of <laughs> yeah breaking well, it's into like, the fine art gallery scene you know yeah. at, after having enjoyed success in illustration, they they really they they didn't understand how or why one would make that switch, and um, and I you know my father explained it to me that more often the the mold for these galleries was we find a young undiscovered artist that we can um, bring along and right. uh, develop know, our our. our our fathers were, uh, they knew what they wanted to do and they were going to do what they wanted to do. And they were already developed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I don't think they ever stopped developing. They right. just didn't want to do, you know, like uh, my father, went, you know, we wouldn't go to a gallery and allow the gallery to say, and we want you to paint this subject matter. No, I'm right. not going to do that. I'm, I'm painting ballet. That's what I'm doing right now. <laughs> right. And so, you know, he took it upon himself to make all these relationships and 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 uh, to create that audience. Uh, he found the venues. I mean, he did, and I don't know actually how much of it. I don't know how much where he started getting assistance. I know you brought up uh, uh, Rocky along the way uh, as a as a manager or as a, a, a I don't know if it consultant, manager, gallery owner, whatever uh, that assisted him along the way. Um, yeah, yeah, Rocky and in. in Rocky did a terrific job in Japan, huge supporter, still is of, of my father's work. And then um, uh, Colin in, in the UK um, did an amazing job uh, there in, in organizing things and, and, and getting the, sh the shows ready. And so, you know, they, they were, they were they were a team, you know. They worked as a team, in a, in a way that I I don't see you know happen typically. You know, it was right. they were you know on the phone every day, you know, plotting how to how to pull off some show and um, who who was going to be there and what the event would feel like. Um, you know, now, like I, I remember that from your father's illustration career, his uh, uh, relationship with Bill Airlocker. 
uh, his agent. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, I remember, because uh, I, I got, as when I started working in the field, I got to know Bill Ehrlacher. And um, uh, in fact, I saw him about the same, the last time I saw him was about the same time I saw your mom, 2007. He had retired to uh, Sarasota, Florida, where I was doing my summer program. And I had, had lunch with him several times. Uh, very nice man. But there was definitely a plan. And the way that your father marketed and advertised himself as an illustrator the last few years of his illustration career was um, was uh, not atypical. I mean, he did it. Uh, uh, he took it to a different place. Um, so, yeah. Do you know what these these were? Are, are these had specific purpose, or did he do them for himself, or what? Those are a set design for uh, a ballet called Garden of Eros. Uh, he, okay. he did paintings and set design. And um, the choreographer uh, was a, a, a lovely lady, Marguerite Porter. And it was, I think, her first ballet. She had been a prima ballerina for, for many years. And, uh, she, and, and he had painted her many times. There's some beautiful ballet paintings of her. I mean, she's a beautiful person. And uh, so... Uh, this is part of the set design and and there, there were you know four gorgeous rose pictures which of course my father loved <laughs> painting because it's you know it was his wife's name and um and actually from this uh painting i think that you've got up here now came that little abstract rose that insignia the, the insignia which from then on he would use as his signature in, you know, that uh, uh, he would stamp that into the corner of each painting. It would be photographed and then he would sign after, you know, photography. Wow. Uh, and, but uh, yeah, I love the, the rose. I've actually got the stamp here, you know. And, oh, cool. Uh, yeah. Very cool. I'm, I'm glad I, I mentioned it. Uh, some of the things that I haven't showed many of, he did. He was phenomenal draftsman, and and he really showed it off a lot uh, in his his uh, his drawings uh, with action. The design, you know, these are vignetted against white, and it's it's very difficult to do make a very complete picture that way. Ab, uh, the abstract design quality of these, the the design work that goes in. Not just thinking about copying something, but make a complete picture out of it. Your father was phenomenal at mm. one of my favorite pieces of your father's early right. pieces. And, and you said yeah, something. Yeah. You, you said something. The non-artist. You said this to me the other day, and I, I thought it was a really dead-on um, observation. Uh, you know, his early ballet work was very uh, not, not stagnant, but was still. It was posed. And later on, things he was capturing action and movement in a way that very few have. And uh, I thought that was a really, really great observation. So kudos to yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, no, it, uh, yeah, wow. that's that's a beautiful piece. Stunning. Yep, back of the canvas again. Yep, leaves a bunch raw. That beautiful, beautiful midtone which takes shots of color so well. <laughs> um, I love it. This is a little soft. I, I, I don't know where I got that, but beautiful painting. Again, these are, you know, he's re really leaning into his technical facilitation on these things. Um, and, you know, the technical facilitation application of material gets stronger and stronger um as these it, as as he keeps uh progressing yeah this is this is later on yeah that's a gourd I, I love these pieces the you know the girl working on her shoes uh the, the little ballerina working on her shoes yeah um i i have all these bullet points that we don't have to discuss each and everything um but at some point when when we start seeing well here we go we got some photos so this is a good time um who is that that's oriana falaci uh she's a 
famous Italian author and interviewer. She, she wrote uh, a, a bunch of books. One was an interview with history and she interviewed Muammar Gaddafi, uh, Golda Meir, um, the, uh, the first head of the Iranian uh, clergy after they took over, um, you know, so she, she was uh, uh, she was dating a close friend of mine at the time, Paolo Nespoli, who went on to become an astronaut. Um, okay, okay, so this this is this is good. This this is this is getting you to the story that you told me the other day. Yeah, yeah. So this you, you this sent me an email about it. This is great. Tell this story. This is wonderful. Yeah. yeah. So so I don't you know I don't I didn't know Oriana at the time, but I met her down in in uh, in in Houston when we were working at NASA. And so I, I was like, Paolo, come to the show in Monte Carlo. And he's like, great, can I bring Oriana? I'm like, of course. And so uh, we, we I, you know, I met Paolo and Oriana in Italy. You know, the, the show was in, in, in Monte Carlo in the South of France. And so I meet them in Italy and uh, Oriana's giving us little tours around. Then we, we get up to, to um, uh, to Monte Carlo, and then at the night of the, the the night before the show, Oriana's like, "Let's go see some friends," and I'm like, "What?" And, mm -hmm. You know, and so me and Paolo go with Oriana. And she's like, "We're we're gonna go to the ballet," and I'm like, "I don't think the ballet is open this time." And I don't know, no, they're there. We go there, and and Princess Caroline is there, and it turns out Oriana and Princess Caroline are great old friends, and then we're walking around. Ma, you know Monte Carlo in the at night with you know Oriana Princess Caroline me and Paolo and her security guards following along <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I'm like well this is kind of surreal and, <laughs> yeah. and then the next night is the show and Princess Caroline is there again and my father's you know giving her a tour around explaining the artwork and I'm like oh we met last night <laughs> 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 that would that would have been terrific to have that. My father thought that was very funny. <laughs> He's like, oh, you yeah, how are you? <laughs> that's yeah. funny. So that's in the Hotel de Paris. Um, but you know, and strangely, the the show you know it was a December show, so not a good time to do a show in Monte Carlo. But some really iconic pieces came out of that show, and um, so interesting. He was like. He was like, well, I learned the hard way. Don't do a show in Monte Carlo <laughs> in December. It's a stupid thing to do. <laughs> uh, Explain that photo. Okay, yeah. This is another, this is another, um, oh, wow, this is a collection. This looks like they've got some Phantom and, um, and some ballet, but this is, another show that Princess Diana attended and my father's, you know, has to do this. He walks her around and explains the, you know, the, the different pieces and everybody takes pictures. And I, <laughs> you know, um, I don't, I don't know if I was at this show, um, but um, the gentleman on the left, I think I just bought three drawings from him because he was downsizing and he had some of my father's work and, he was like, uh, you know, and I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll buy him, a, uh, I think it's three, three phantom drawings. Cool. So it's funny. Oh, yeah. this is, I think this is uh, actually from the ballet that Princess Diana sponsored and asked my father to do uh, the artwork for. Um, London I'm City Ballet, London City Ballet, yeah. I'm going to kind of, man, I don't have to pick up the pace too much. I, I want the images to be seen. Yeah. Um, we don't have to discuss each of them. I mean, we can just, <laughs> yeah, good. You know, it's, like, it's, it's kind of like watching fireworks, you know, uh, it's like, you know, you get the oohs and ahs, and, you know, you get that experience of seeing the work and they're all phenomenal, beautiful pictures. Yeah. If there's something that you want to say about any one of them, please do. Um there, I, I think some of the uh, phantom work shows up here. 
in just a minute or two, in a few slides. Again, um, I don't know what year he did this piece, but it, that's it's, early. It's much more straightforward um, than where he took it. You can see him build building to get there. Yeah, one, two, three. Yeah, this is later, a little later on. Gorgeous pieces. Oh, that's a great piece. Yeah. I think that's from Requiem, uh, from uh, another Andrew Lloyd Webber uh, production. Okay, here's Penguin. Penguin. Cafe. Yep. That's stunning. Yeah. <laughs> it's so okay. weird. Beautiful. So, again, back to influence. Again, another. Yeah. Sledgehammer yeah. hitting me over the head when I saw this thing. I was just like, oh my God, that is just only he could have done that. That's so stunning. Such a great design. The three phases of the Phantom or the three individuals of the Phantom, so beautifully executed. Um, it this this impacted a lot of people in the in the illustration world. Um, people that I know that you know were looking at what Bob was doing, you know, from the outside looking in. And when we saw this, it's like, man, he's showing his he's showing off his design skills and his drawing chops and his use of materials. It's just it's impressive. Yeah, yeah, and that is one of my favorite pieces. That's a nice piece. <laughs> this is a popular piece, but not, not one of my favorites. That I love. Oh, boy. Gorgeous. That's. There you go. That Grizabella. I forgot which cat is which. <laughs> I think it's Grizabella. And so again, he was doing more. He got into doing set design. He got into do like even costume design. Um, That's right. And I, I, again, I I should have. I don't have that any of that included. Uh, except well, I do have a couple. I think this. That's yeah. That's costume design. And man, I just love this piece. And I just. Man, <laughs> oh God, uh, I love that piece. But the costume design, he did quite a bit of it. And this is a really simplified one, but he did a lot of these costumes. You know, what I'm used to seeing like costume design and character design for the animation world or for the, um, of the gaming world, uh, where it's very precise, very exact, because it has to be modeled and made. But your father's approach in the, you know, for theater was, I mean, just really organically done, beautifully painted, um, and seeing it was is, was such a such a, a joy, a pleasure of seeing it just beautifully painted. Yeah. Oh, I love this stuff. <laughs> I, I, I like that piece. <laughs> so strange. <laughs> yep, everyone's off the ground. You know what this is for? Beautiful piece. You protecting know Veil. Uh, it, it's a from ballet, The Protecting Veil. Wow. A series of, you know, the, all the, the dancers, a lot of the dancers are, have these veils and, you know, with their movements. And so I think he, he really enjoyed painting that because he got you know, I got to paint fabric moving through air right. with the dancer. What he did, like, on the edge of the page here, or the edge of the image, it just... <laughs> yeah, what, what is that? You know, it, like... <laughs> that's beautiful is what it is, Troy. It's just beautiful. It's great mark making, great texture, great energy. Um, man. <laughs> All right. Gorgeous work. How to do it. Okay, so where are we here? 
Yeah, this is um, uh, this is no theater. Um, so he he's a, he's one of the I think the few Western artists to get the opportunity to paint both uh, Kabuki and no theater, and these are just to me haunting images. I, I've got the prints for these. Um, the, the princess owns the originals, uh, Princess Takamado. Um, and she, she'll show them sometimes, you know, loan them out for shows. But the, the, these to me are just so haunting. I love looking at them. There's a, yeah, this is the other, I, I've got them next to each other. They're just gorgeous. And, um, and so he was, he actually had a lot of success in Japan. And yeah. uh, kind of the same thing there, royalty, um, uh, um patronage and uh participants in his shows and asking him to do things for shows um he was a charming devil <laughs> <laughs> now what why why are some of these on the black background and any any insight into uh why he put these on a black background i don't know um does it work better that way or something? Yeah. Or? Oh, 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 just as a technical question you're asking, it's like uh, if my father was to explain painting, he said, the first thing you decide what you're going to paint and where it's going to go on the page, he says, and then in picture making 101, you decide if this is going to be a light thing against the dark background or a dark thing against the light background. Okay. And, All right. And, and, it, and it, it really goes, you know, the more complicated your picture gets, the more it's like a game of chess and um you know dramatic lighting works great against a dark background okay so he had to decide this or at the beginning yeah i think it's a pictorial thing i think it's you know, a design decision and you say this is the story dark i don't know i don't know the narrative well, it's a you know love lost kind of story um i don't know that it's you know it's love and life it can be dark <laughs> <laughs> just life in general <laughs> yep all right okay, yeah, so that's uh, that's princess takamado uh with me and my brother todd at a show in tokyo um like five years ago maybe um so she she's such a lovely person um and and it's 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 almost embarrassing. She knows more about my father's artwork than I do, because really? she herself is 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 a bit of an artist, and you know she's incredibly smart person, and you know has studied up on everything, and uh, yeah. So you can see here she is explaining the art to me. <laughs> you know, and Todd knew more than I did, so you know, like because I'm like the technologist in the family, and I'm like. Oh, is that so? I didn't ever <laughs> do that. <laughs> Interesting. Really, really nice of her to do these things. Gosh, she's a beautiful dancer. And they, they were nice. These dancers would come to the shows, um, you know, so you could and often pose in front of the picture that they were painted in. Really? Really, really fun. What a good, what a, what a it's great one we argue about that that blue one because it's 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 not standard fare for my dad to do something so clean right and so, so very photographic yeah so so a lot of people like it a lot and and then a lot of people you know are like no that's that's not what he does um so you know it, it generates some arguments <laughs> well you got to do those things, keep people guessing, right? Yeah. Uh, I, 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 can, I can hear your father's explanation of it. <laughs> he would sell it. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think that's yeah. right. Quinn. Again, it's like, you know, one after the other, a beautiful picture. Scottish so, ballet. Again. Darcy Bustle, yeah, famous dancer uh, for the Royal Ballet. 
Wow. I can, how, how do you think the, uh, personally, did he get to know any of these people beyond just the acquaintance level or did, did, yeah, sometimes uh, that, you know, if he was focusing on one of them, he wanted to get to know them reasonably well. And so they'd go out for drinks, dinner, what have you, and, and, and talk more because ultimately he, he wanted to portray the, the feelings they were having. I don't, I'm sure you know this, but, but a lot of times he's portraying them uh, from when they're in rehearsal rather than when they're in the actual production right. because he always felt like you were getting more raw emotion when they were unguarded and they were practicing and rehearsing the piece well yeah. i like i like that from the very beginning you know getting permission to go and observe the dancers in rehearsal um and then you know what what uh, one of the choreographers had had written about him is it, you know just being this you know he said that he, he referred to bob as these spying eyes in the background yes <laughs> and he became invisible which was you know he didn't uh, the worst thing would happen is that you would be disruptive or cause a problem where he wouldn't be allowed to do that and so to be able to conform and be a chameleon in 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 that scenario is is incredibly important yeah uh, he could be quiet <laughs> it does it a couple of things couple a couple of things from just the the practical stance of you know practice not interrupting not causing an issue from their point of view, but from his point of view, if you can get people re relaxed enough with you, then they can just be themselves and they can, you see the real thing. Yeah. Um, and his ability to do that it, 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 it was a very important part of this process. Yeah, yeah. He, he wanted to, he wanted to connect with the unguarded moments of the dancers. You know, he, he knew they had perfect bodies. He wanted to see their emotions come through at those pivotal moments during rehearsal. No, and I think I, I, that's a difficult thing to do in covering events. Yes, I, I yeah, listened. I, I, I listened to Bernie and, and Bernie and Bart, Bart Forbes talked to me about this, about co covering uh, traveling with the PGA, covering a, a golfer who they, you know, said were sometimes not the kindest of people <laughs> and, uh, they were they were very uh, uh uh intense and competitive and you know you can see it like you know you you, you play golf now that like you know if a fly interrupts somebody's back swing, swing can you imagine a trigger a camera going off that type of thing and, yeah. and so knowing your environment and knowing what your limitations are and and knowing a part of what you're doing um, investing yourself in the act of doing it. I think that your father was very acute to that. Yeah. Yeah. He learned. Yeah, that's beautiful. Another cats. Great piece. These things, these are the, the you know, these are some of the pieces that your observation the other day, as we come towards the end, the capturing of the movement. Um, the 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 willingness to uh as you said revert back to maybe more of a childistic child's point of view in the way that that, that he was drawing um uh, this is probably a little bit more of a primitive approach a uh, naive approach of uh, approaching the figure yeah yeah eve yeah and and then there's these uh painted wall right. yeah abstract stuff and this is uh yeah me and my brothers and my mother yeah he said he said that this came from um uh he was inspired by the cave paintings that he saw in his trips to africa that's right yeah where inspiration comes from <laughs> and that's one of the early ones that's like i think that's painted wall number three <laughs> Something. but um you see the number you know he had three boys and uh and my older brother who 
who died very young, uh, that's, you know, it, he, he was a Pisces. My father right. wasn't into astrology, but he was in, into symbols. And so you've got, you know. It, very interesting. I, 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 you brought, I was going to maybe not bring it up uh, about your brother passing in like 1990, I guess, to yeah. 30 or 31 years of age. Um, someone that I was fortunate to really be a part of his life for a long time and um uh someone I truly truly cared for um but the how your father handled that yeah you know, how you saw it come out of his artwork I didn't show any of the Toby paintings I didn't uh but but he dug into it um I've had a similar experience I I I can't go there I mean I can't I can't I can barely look at a photo of my my son that I've lost and yeah. uh, uh, how he did that. And it, it was just like, you could see it was cathartic. It was something to work him way, his way. Express yeah, it's, emotions. It's how he dealt with grief. Yeah. Everybody deals with it differently. And yeah. that worked for him. Yeah. As much as it can, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely stunning images. Um, I, I, <laughs> I call these the blurry period. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, oh. Yeah. You're asking an engineer now. You know? <laughs> <It's> blurry. <laughs> oh. I like them. <laughs> They're beautiful. Yes, they are beautiful. And this this is one of my favorite paintings of your father's. I I you know, I just I don't know what year he did it. This is Monte Carlo. This is so it was pretty this early was on time. the wall in uh, the studio, one of the studio photographs you showed. Oh, cool. Um, well, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it has all aspects of him in there. Um, you know, his, his great design sense that kind of separates him apart from many. Uh, his use of materials, his, under, his facilitation of drawing and painting at the highest level. And, you know, he shows off as, as you, if you work backwards, you go back and it's, I always do this with my dad's work. It's like, it could have been four or five really successful careers in different directions. Um, yeah. they, they were so capable. And, you know, that group of six artists that we talked about at the beginning, there was something in the water going on in Westport, Connecticut. In <laughs> yeah. uh, that those, that, that, that they all, interacted with each other and you know went you know some went their separate ways as far as direction and uh in the you know outside of the illustration industry but they were all magnificent artists and yes yeah, yeah really uh i think a rare thing a beautiful thing yeah absolutely not for us as children That's right it made it made it made our lives very interesting <laughs> um this is uh uh how he left his studio, right? Yeah, this is the studio in Guilford um, as as it was uh, a few days after he died. And you can see he's got uh, three ballet paintings going on at once yeah. uh, in that one in the middle, obviously, unfinished. Right. Uh, and, uh, yeah. That's, uh... So how, how long did the room sit like this? Oh, a good while. Um, I would, you know, you know, probably after less than a year, you know, we started cleaning things up, and uh, you know, take it, we take the paintings down and store things. Right. Um, but it, it took a while to to clean it all up. I'm asking. I'm trying to decide timeline because I saw it this way when I visited your mom. Yeah. And um so it was probably within a year that i was there so 2006 sometime yeah uh, um troy do you have anything uh that you want to promote anything of your father's anything just generally you want to suggest or talk about i would love to give people the opportunity to take their time to do this with me to say something about anything that's going on in their lives or with yeah your well it, it, sure and that'd be great yeah at the beginning we talked about um i'm curating the uh uh, catalog raisonne for my for my father and um you know love it if uh 
anybody went and took a look at it. It's uh, easy to find. It's just his name.com. So Robert Heindel.com, or you could use R Heindel.com and, uh, and check it out, you know, browse through it. It's, uh, it's a huge body of work and, um, you know, I've tried to organize it in, in a way that I think he would have organized it. And um, yeah, love, love for people to see that and share feedback. Um, always trying to improve it. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Uh, Troy, thank you for your time. Thank you for a huge uh, amount of entertainment you brought me. Uh, <laughs> John, I loved it. Enjoyed it. <laughs> very much by <laughs> seeing you and talking to, with you and uh well we'll, we'll know, keep we'll keep it going we'll yes. keep it going we'll uh, all right uh thank you so much uh 